Uh, hello uh, and welcome to Istanbul once again. Uh, Contemporary Part uh, 2013 conference uh, has been organized by me, my son, Fine Arts University and uh, Eastern Mediterranean Academic Research Center. .com. So, me, my son, University School uh, is actually the oldest architecture and fine arts school in Turkey. Um, and uh, DACOM is an uh, independent academic organization uh, and, and recently established uh, association uh, with the aim to organize interdisciplinary conferences, workshops, uh, etc. Um, well, uh, Contemporary Conference, this is the second year of Contemporary Conference. So it's um, so we are we are lucky to see sim um, familiar faces. Uh, the theme of the <coughs> conference is, uh, as you all know, it urban life and contemporary arts. Well, urban life, uh, which has begun to take its recent forms, beginning from the 19th century, is uh, one of the determinant phenomena on uh, human psychology, culture, and politics. Uh, forms of urban culture, new indi industrial developments, crowd, traffic, street life, sociality, communication, rebellions, and political oppression are all to be traced in the city life. Urban life is a scene, tool, and as a subject of contemporary and, of course, modern arts needs to be rediscussed in the new millennium, that's what we were uh, thinking um, before organizing the conference. Uh, the discussions of the conference are going to be uh, focused on the progress of the co contemporary arts uh, in relation to the city and on the city itself as an atelier for the art production and on case studies of urban space. Uh, thus, we have three days of the conference and three main sub-themes, uh, so to speak, sub-topics. Uh, namely, contemporary arts in transformation, secondly, urban space as an atelier, and city as the scene of the art. Uh, these are the three uh, main uh, sub-topics of the conference. Uh, well, uh, I hope you will all enjoy the conference and that shall be a brief opening speech. Uh, thank you very much once again. First session of the first day of the conference begins. Um, for the first presentation, Hande Tulum will present her work entitled Outdoor Scenes and Behind. The second presentation will be from Marina Gacto, Transforming Spaces and Interdisciplinary Approach to Installation Art. And the third one will be Radoslav Filip Muniak's presentation entitled Topographies of Absence. And then we will have the questions, Q&A, and after that we will have the lunch at 12.30. that this presentation uh, will be just a hint about street art. So if you are passionate about street art, I think you should uh, look forward to see other representations also. Um, I would like to start with a phrase uh, that belongs to Banksy. Imagine a city where graffiti wasn't illegal. A city where everybody should draw, could draw wherever they liked where every street was a wedge with a million colors and little phrases, where standing at bus stop was never boring, 
a city that felt like a party where everyone was invited, not just the estate agents and parents of big business. Imagine a city like that and stop leaning against the wall. It's wet. Something huge happened around the time that pop art entered the art world. Modernism, through the influence of formal theory and criticism, had separated art and life by insisting that the significance of art is never relational. But conversely, there is no way to separate art and life and nature. Because art is attached to life by an chord. Life is the one which makes the art live. Life gives source to the fetus, I mean art, for being alive. On the other hand, art is contemporary. It's always new and present. Consequently, the fetus art is never born. Life doesn't allow it to create a being excluding the life itself. So, the court is always temporary. And if one tries to intersect the umbilical court, because of the cut of the artistic limitation, the fetus can die. But without art, life can be dead also. At that point, as a part of contemporary art, street art pops up. It becomes a response to modernism, which tries to classify and separate everything it occurs. Street, street art is a movement that covers distance uh, with the everyday life. Hereafter, street art is the one that chases the modern life. The term contemporary is now a present time fact. And nowadays, every single thing is present because time changes, collapses, and transforms everything that is seen. And also, past has passed, future is nothing but ambiguity. So present is what we look for. Present is the one which the modern world look, looks for. Because of the meaning of modern, I mean new and trendy, every component of the modern world is not contemporary. City, life, art is contemporary. Beyond all this, Street art, which speaks for including those who are excluded, uh, is a crowd art. Street art is the voice of the public. We hope the people who want a new life. But street art is a thing that's not always appreciated or took credit for its effect. Is it art or a crime? Alpaslan tried to, tried to define street art as a type of a crime, then examined it using criminological perspective with criminological and deviant theories, but she only could came up with the conclusion that street art, neither street art is a crime, nor the street art is a, is a criminal. Man only plays when he is in the fullest sense of the word of a human being, and he is only fully a human being when he plays. Schiller's definition of humanity of a man designates the term homo ludens. Homo ludens means the playing human being, so, it will be easy to associate the term homo ludens with an artist, especially a contemporary artist. The contemporary graffiti artist is a 24-7 homo ludens. So, being a human can be a crime nowadays. I personally don't think vandalism means street art or the adverse. Street art is not planned or organized by the power or the stuff of the power and authority. This spontaneous nature of street art prompts it to be a part of the underground one. But we shouldn't forget about something. A city didn't exist to play a role on the minds of leaders or architects. A city existed for involving time and memories. Arriving at each new city, the traveler finds again a past of his and that he didn't know he had. Street art may be the only uh, criminal art that's a bridge between street actions and art creates a mutual segment. At this segment, governments try to domesticate street art and art. So the system gives them walls as, an urban, as urban canvases to work on it. Thereby, the system will be nourished by tourists. Tourists will make the seas rich. The street art will be under control. But the system forgets about something. Street art won't accept any type of restriction because, in a way, it's limitless. And this type of art wasn't used to be illegal. In Pompeii, everyone wrote on the exteriors of the houses, streets, baths, and nobody got arrested. It seems like the street arts were free those days. So it feels like the main problem isn't the street art. The problem is the problem traveled new world and new world toilet. So it seems like a mystery. Why is street art now a vandalism? While we get civilized, 
transitorship occurred and managed to behave absurd. Unfortunately, trying to understand why the system tried to erase the samples of street art but conserve cave paintings is an impossible attempt. But this gives birth to new street art samples, of course, because street arts don't give up, they keep working. And at this point, a person in street art gets closer. Human must distract constantly to rebuild himself. On the other hand, street art is also a domestic attitude. Street art gives the walls uh, of the world to the people. Street art tries to make the streets a home, which is a cover that modern person draws in. Can a street be a home? According uh, to a Turkish woman novelist, Latifa Tekin, it seems so. She created the character Dirmit in this way. Dirmit, who is a young girl, always tries to be on the street. Streets talk to her, stars, sky and sea call her. In spite of all the interventions of her fa family, she runs to the streets and tries to be happy. And modern world has ended an era. The era that people used to live in actual houses. A new era has begun. Desires have broke out of homes, because the home isn't enough anymore. People want to live in cities, not just in a home. Privacy is lost, home is away, and people who want to get away from their homeland want to go somewhere. Street art is an attitude against the elitist art. Art shouldn't be edited, because art is a part of life and people. It is related to the community. This property of street art makes the exhibitions art galleries, auction sales useless. City is the new exhibition hall. Public space is the new art gallery. And anyone can see a piece of art at the street, so he or she doesn't need to buy. And also, it isn't just uh, community art, because it can be personal too. It isn't only nice or positive. Like contemporary art, city, street art constitutes an intensely uneven patchwork of utopian and dystopian spaces. So, at this point, space and place and art is only attached to the present time factor. Street art makes us experience the world. Furthermore, street art, streets are the places that people always exist, that people aren't excluded. That's why street art is the representation of the public. Here, rebellion, reaction, will, power, resistance and freedom. And representation needs an area that can affect on. Street art tries to tell what it's about, but it doesn't try to teach. It gives space one to choose. It gives us chance for refusing a part of the society of the spectacle. Beyond all the following, street art is bounded to architecture. It uses the wall. And with this, it is positioned uh, to a near stop to architecture. While architecture makes and builds a city, street art tries to corrupt and transform. The symbol of city offers new opportunities uh, to mention about the tension between rationalism and human life. That's why that, uh, street artists choose the city to activate the protest street art. Memory constantly needs to be refreshed for the sake of the existence of the city. Briefly, for these reasons, the individual uh, chooses the street as a public memory space. Here's a new, new question, mainly, uh, what does street art do? There are seven capital headings. These are urban canvas, natural waste, activated, advertised, public privacy, attachments, and localized. So, street art tries to dissolve the borderline between the private and the public, the family and the alien. Street art tries to mirror and distort uh, it with its very own image. Street art tries to do new ads to get uh, rid of the billboards that people don't want. The main difference between street art and street advertising is that one can lead you to jail uh, while another can even earn you money. Street art declares the world as its canvas. Street art refreshes artistic adjectives and attentions within the cityscape. Street art tries to make a cynical, dramatic and interactive effect. In addition to this, Street art is loud and supported by too many because something different happens. Art, which is usually transcendent, transforms something imminent. Thereby, art got close to public. It became from public. Street artists move with the desire of performing anywhere. 
They want to reflect the present street art culture worldwide. So they travel, travel a lot. In conclusion, this mo movement is planar. It lives and reflects the present time and just only culture. For conclusion, I prefer a motto for the new appearance of the world. Let's look at street art and its playground, the world and its components. And last week, we lost the street artist, Pasha, um, aka Russian Maxi. The circumstances around his death remain unknown, uh, and I think this is real, really weird. These are examples from his studies. I recommend you to look uh, all of his work. And that's all. Thank you for listening. department in this university in Spain. And although you can see the whole paper in the proceedings, I'm going to be talking more about the experience I had with my students and how uh, they became to understand uh, contemporary art, not only by looking at it, but also by uh, creating it. And in this case, we, were, we are going to be talking about uh, installation art. As we all know, installation art is a postmodern journal of contemporary art in which materials are disposed to influence the way we experience or perceive a particular space. Uh, this space, uh, space work, unlike traditional artwork, um, is usually created at the exhibition site and its essence is a spectator involvement. Uh, creating expectations and illusions when the viewer enters a controlled environment featuring objects as well as light, sounds or projected imagery. Our approach focuses on art installation, art, uh, artistic intervention in physical spaces designed to make us rethink our life and values. It also complements our visual culture by understanding the balance between conceptual and technical elements. This study deals with the uh, social application of art installation in the field of education and communication, taking a disciplinary approach as a key feature. In our research, we found that this interdisciplinary character offers three very interesting possibilities. We present an interdisciplinary study of the installation focuses on the values provided and disciplines involved while changing the space's physical conception. In this visually orientated world, the understanding and the importance of installation art as a way of uh, contemporary art, uh, we think that uh, it would facilitate in our society the integration between the public and, and the artist. According to Schreinbeck, by integrating our knowledge and experiences while working with the spatial elements, we can develop a broadened concept of life that nurtures ourselves both artistically and personally. She says that moreover, with the practice of installation, we enhance a cognitivity, ability, sensitivity, and the life-affirming pleasure of making art. As the artist Ilya Kavakov considers, art installation is a young discipline whose rules of construction are yet known with uh, with certainty, uh, conditioning the artist to move using their feelings and intuition. 
this uh, statement allows us to reflect on the analysis difficulties because it is govern governed by non-rational parameters, intuitions, feelings, the intangible, understandable or undefinable. The artists explore the spatial aspects of installations, linking it to the architecture and establishing three categories depending on the relationship with the architectural space. She uh, talks about uh, small installations, which include various objects combination. She also mm, points at the second category, the ones located on the wall, taking the entire world part of the ground. We can see here an example. It's called the communal kitchen, and it was uh, in the exhibition, expo exhibition of 1992. And third, she points the most important category, or the most, uh, she called it the total installation, because it's the more global and most developed one. And it's the one that is completely occupying the place that has been allocated. Related to this, Kavakov considers that 70% of an, insta an installation uh, success depends on its location. So the bigger the size is, it is, the, the more success uh, the, insta the installation will have. Um, this, in this way, she says that the uh, installation in a museum will always be more successful than a small installation probably display or in display in a private studio. Um, that's why we think that uh, uh, is the main reason why art installation really hasn't received a lot of uh, scholarly attention due to the fact that it can also be dismantled and uh, that's why it has also resisted the uh, research, uh, research as uh, other Western art uh, uh, ways of art. Um, here we have another example. We, we use a lot of uh, Bill Viola artwork. This was on display in, in Murcia, which is the city where uh, the university is. And it's, uh, we think it's very positive because it, it talks about the cycle of life and it also uses uh, lots of sound, not only music, but um, all kinds of uh, technology are involved in this sort of installation. Uh, talking about the importance of disciplinary in arts, uh, well, we want to point out that uh, the Gemma's Kunstwerk uh, is the, um, as uh, Richard Wagner point, is the most important, uh, the most complete artwork. And he used, he used uh, this term to refer uh, uh, for referring to opera because it was the most holistic form of, um, of expression. And this is uh, what, what, why uh, we think art installation art is very important for our students because through all these um, uh, through painting, through sculpture, through architecture, through all of them, they can really get to understand the uh, importance of um, interdisciplinary studies because uh, uh, it's important to support research, uh, visual art, music and literature because concerns the transfer of metals from one discipline to another. That is the main uh, uh, importance of interdisciplinary studies. In our installation, we find this kind of dialogue between all these disciplines where media, technique, and interpersonal expression converge in the artistic realm. Contemporary art is based on the cross-cutting nature, leading art installation to the, to the inclusion of major arts. Painting, uh, it's, uh, as Kavakov says, refers uh, to painting as the mother of the installation art because they serve the same perceptive media, same as the sculptor. Uh, the architecture uh, is related to art installation because it involves the integration of two-dimensional artwork within its environment. We can also find that uh, literature and poetry are closely related because um, depending on the phonetic function of the human voice or the music, or even with, uh, as we said, with viola acoustic sounds, it, the meaning of the installation can totally change. Uh, theater, like um, theater, dance, music and film, like art installation, belongs to the family of uh, arts with temporal components. 
So it possesses the capacity to change time, not only in a, in a female dimension, but also because of the movement that is required for the visitors in the installation. Uh, we also find that new media and technology, um, well, it's very important for the installations, and they are deeply connected not to many other types of art expressions as well. So what we uh, what we do with our students, we we want them to develop by um, creating art installation these competencies, cognitive by understanding the characteristic of the visual languages, the visual language around them is not only about art, but they have to understand what's going on, what's the contemporary art around their own city and around the media. Uh, procedural and instrumental uh, competencies, understanding and appreciating the importance of art for the integration formation of human beings. These students are going to be kindergarten teachers. Attitudinal being sensitive to new social and multicultural development strategies for inclusive education and promoting processes of empathy, sensitivity, and capacity of building for understanding of the artistic expression of others. The main objectives then are based on uh, being able to communicate artistically with the visual and verbal languages, developing a critical thinking, creating a personal language in order to communicate, bringing contemporary art to everyday life, developing their enjoyment for the visual language, and linking formal and conceptual content while participating in their own group dynamic. These are some of the results that we can uh, see uh, these were uh, made, as I said, by the students. This first installation is about uh, mirrors, how we look at ourselves, how we are look from uh, the other people's point of view. They try to change the atmosphere while they're disposing these mirrors. And they were decorated by them as well. This uh, played with the darkness and the sounding of uh, the everyday city as a way of uh, stress. This was uh, developed as a technique to think about their everyday life, the stress of the everyday city, and by, cut, by cutting all these uh, pieces of paper hanging from the ceiling, they were able to escape from this uh, overwhelming panic and this stress. And this was uh, like a kindergarten part. They, they, made, uh, they were trying to recreate the happiness of kids. And well, they used uh, certain uh, recycled elements as well as the use of color. Um, on the one down, we can see a house made out of um, color. And they tried to... Um, it was a way of relaxing in, they created the house uh, as a meaning of their own house and being comfortable with uh, themselves through the colors and through also they used the classical music to create a nice atmosphere. This one, they were like, one of them, the one with the balloons, it was uh, created a certain, like Kavakov said, this, this wouldn't be a all complete installation, and they were trying to recreate a birthday party by the sounds and the, uh, this is uh, balloons used uh, usually in, in, in birthday parties. And the other one was also recreating the atmosphere of, of overwhelming stress situations, but it's important because they deal with their own. Um, personal emotions. And this uh, last one that I wanted to take into, so that you could all see, it's an installation that they developed in the bathrooms of the university. And they used uh, sadness. Uh, sadness was represented by the blue. They used uh, certain colors to represent emotions. The yellow one you can see, it's happiness. Okay, Bob, sponge Bob, and all sorts of uh, happy images. The red one was, uh, they used uh, red as a traditional color for passion or love. You can see kisses, all sort of 
uh, um, images. And then the black one was very thrilling. I mean, it was the uh, terror and death. So people were very impressed when they walked into the bathroom and they saw all these things. So as a main conclusion, I'd like to say that the results obtained with this uh, experiment, they really exceed initial expectations, covering and developing many disciplines in one. I'm providing the students with critical tools to understand the contemporary art around them. This indicates that teaching us can be successfully developed changing spaces and communicating feelings with plastic creation and contemporary languages. Thank you very
the space of the representation becomes a stage on which a transform, tra transfiguration unfolds. The image gains spatial presence. This process can be called enspacing. Its source are the symptoms of movement that barely visible concentrate on the peripheries of the represented person in the slight deformities of the outline, the imperfections of the clothing and hair, the inaccurate representation of a moving leaf, or the blurring of butterfly wings in flight. These symptoms do not change the structure of the represented figure, but to the viewer a type of anchor, bait, or peephole, by which he enters the image's space and allows the image to enter his. The painted space of Yulandao's fresco opens the area surrounding the church in such a way that the real space seems to turn inside out, like a glove. Philippe Alain Mouchot describes this effect with the metaphor of an inverse window. A window, I quote, that opens not onto a distant space, an imaginary or far-off landscape, but onto the exterior of Santa Trinita itself. When entering the church and approaching the image, the spectator proceeds smoothly from the side of the real city to that of its representation. He returns to the world by means of images. The space around him becomes imaged, and the image becomes in space. The image sucks him in, so to speak. These notions lead to a new form of perception, termed emotional epistemology, which is fundamental to and spacing. And when a subject matter of, of the work of art is loss, creates that what I call topographies of absence. Felix Gonzalez Torres collected toys. In an interview, he describes how in the early 90s, during his rotten years, while living in a tiny apartment in Brooklyn, almost suicidal, one Sunday morning he went to a flea market. One of the vendors had a bag of Disney figures. You can have them all for five bucks, said the woman. So he did. When he returned home and began taking out all the Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Pluto, and Goofy toys, for the first time in months or even years, he felt happy. From that day on, he collected toys. Toys, according to him, were imprinted with traces of someone's happiness, someone's joy. When holding such an object in your hands, you could experience this joyful past through its lack. Absence and presence form a kind of double bind, each constantly countermining the other's instructions. They have been withdrawn the toys have been withdrawn from the world of childhood, but somehow still remain there. According to Felix Gonzalez Torres, experiencing loss is a way of reconnecting to the present. This is extremely evident in his candy works, especially the piece entitled Lover Boys, dedicated to his lifelong partner, Ross Laycock, who died of AIDS. Upon entering the gallery, we are confronted with a heap of colorful candy piled up in the corner. We are invited to take some, a childhood dream come true. Later, later we learn that the weight of all this candy corresponds to the exact body weight of Felix and his partner, or in some cases just to the weight of Ross. I was losing the, uh, Felix writes, I was losing the most important person in my life, who for the first time in my life gave me a home. Why not punish myself some more so the pain would be lesser? I began letting go of the work so it would disappear entirely. The work is often interpreted as a metaphor for AIDS. That is true. But what interests me is how the process of disappearing affects the space around the installation. People eat the candy, which symbolizes the bodies of the artist and or his partner. Therefore, every minute, there becomes less and less of the work of the partner of them. The space empties itself out, so to speak. 
through the act of viewer consumption, which is very point, which is a very poignant metaphor for art per se, as if we were devouring the space itself. But despite the emotional weight of the work, there is an immense joy in the process of disappearing, because it is achieved through a childlike pleasure of eating candy, like Gonzalez Torres's toy collections. The diminishing amount of candy symbolically refers to Laycock's body languishing from the disease. But despite what he said, the artist make sh made sure that the art survives by instructing that the candy be constantly replaced. In 1989, Gonzalez Torres began making his block-like stacks of paper, printed with content relating to his private life or picturing enigmatic images like this one, from which the viewer again was invited to take a sheet. Rather than cons uh, constituting a solid, immovable monument, the stacks can be dispersed, depleted and renewed over time. As he was known to repeat, Without the public, these works are nothing. I need the public to complete the work. I ask the public to help me, to take responsibility, to become part of my work, to join in. Bringing one home, hanging it on the wall, you accumulate your own emotional connections to this scene. You enspace the image in your own life. Gonzalez Torres wanted his works to exist, or rather function, in many places at the same time. They were only a starting point from which the viewer himself should expand the experience. The viewer should end the work, as the artist would often say. Such is the dynamic of his most famous piece, one especially essential to this presentation and to understanding topographies of absence in urban space. In 1992, Museum of Modern Art organized a group exhibition called Project 34, during which Gonzalez Torres exhibited 22 billboards located in different parts of New York. The project was recently repeated during the exhibition of Inside Out. All the billboards show the same picture, without the name of the author or institution. A bed with two pillows and bedding. The pillows were crumbled. Someone had slept in this bed. Two people, judging from the recesses, but left abruptly. A simple image, basic in its message. An abandoned bed. Let us imagine that we're returning home from work, tired, looking forward to a beer and some TV. The city is alive, intense, full of all kinds of presence. We just got out of a crowded subway, Everything around us is sound. We are pushing our way through a busy sidewalk, bumping onto people, having to share our space with unwanted body parts. Suddenly, we look up and see this intimate scene, this quiet, painful representation of loss. We don't know what it is, but the image takes hold of us, takes hold of the space around us, takes the city, in its possession. Everything seem, seems impregnated with longing, with absence. The street looks different, somehow sad yet peaceful. The liquor store around the corner less intrusive. The bar, the supermarket, the buildings, all of them fall silent as if disappear. We come home and everything points to something else. The couch in the living room reminds us of our past lovers. The refrigerator of estranged friends and the bathroom sink of dead family members. There is nothing more fundamental in evoking absence than the image of an empty bed. But it's not only about the image, but how it enspaces the city, how it engrosses it with a form of estrangement, the very image of lack. It starts with a tear. You think, nothing big just a little crack. Then you look forward, it goes on, all the way to the turbid hall. As you walk beside it, your anxiety increases. 
The tear becomes bigger and bigger, eating away onto, into the ground of tape water, affecting the space from the bottom up, so to speak. Doris Salcedo, the author of this work, said that, the, said that memory must work between the figure of the one who has died and the one disfigured by this death. The work I'm referring to her is her Unilever series piece called Shibole. Salcedo writes in the introduction to her exhibition catalog, Shibole is a negative space. It addresses the hole in history that marks the bottomless difference that separates whites from non-whites. The hole in history that I am referring to is the history of racism, which, which runs parallel to the history of modernity and is the untold dark side. Shibboleth refers to a custom, phrase, or use of language that acts as a test of belonging to or as a test to becoming a member of a particular social class, profession, cultural group, etc. Its meaning, uh, its meaning originates from the Bible, the Book of Judges, which describes the massacre of the Ephraimites at the hand of the Gileadites who having defeated the former, challenged any survivors seeking to cross the river Jordan for protection to utter the word shibole. The Ephraimites, unable to enunciate the sh sound, pronounced it shibole, and in doing so sentenced themselves to death. This was the largest massacre recounted in the Bible. 42,000 were killed. At that point, the Ephraimites were no longer the aggressors, but refugees, des but re refugees desperately trying to reach their homeland. Salcedo cuts the space of Tate Modern and consequently the space of London, of all Western cities for that matter. The act of cutting is motivated by anger and the will to harm. Salcedo's anger is directed at the urban space, which isolates those who do not fit in, who are locked up in ghettos or simply rid of. Through her work, she wants to harm the establishment, the space of social, cultural, and racial inequality, to create a moment of disjuncture in the space, both literally and metaphorically. Cuts also offer the means to find out what lies beneath the surface, to uncover something. This strategy con connects Salcedo's work with that of Felix Gonzalez Torres, both of them by imposing a feeling of absence onto the space, want to honor memories, emotions, meanings hidden in the city. The phenomenology of cutting space is best seen in the works of Lucio Fontana, who began to puncture and slice the surface of his canvases to create what he himself called spatial art. This strategy was taken to the extreme by U.S. artist Gordon Mataclock, who questioned architecture's stability and its role of shaping space by cutting apparatures into direct buildings designed destined for destruction. He turned these fixed structures into spatial situations that end space the surroundings with a, with, with a sense of precariousness and instability. The house is broken, letting in loss and absence, like Salcedo's Shibole, which cracks London, pulls apart the urban landscape. The tear and Tate Modern is a spatial reminder for visitors who are delighting in the views across the river of the city of London with its architect-designed skyscrapers, Victorian chapels, and exquisite townhouses, attesting to wealth and power, must remember the windowless back of the building which overlooks the less respectable areas of South London, traditionally home to immigrants, the poor and discarded. In this sense, Salcedo's work is a brutal doubling of the river Thames, which for centuries was a natural shibboleth in the city, dividing the space into two. Bogota, November. The year is 1985. Picture it. 
You are walking home from work next to the Palace of Justice when you hear screaming and gunshots. The square turns into chaos. Everyone is running in a different direction. The city is inflamed with anxiety, fear and shock. The space becomes tangible, alive. Everything is painfully present. On the 6th and 7th of November, a massacre occurred in Bogota, killing over 100 people when a group of 35 guerrilla, guerrillas invaded the palace and during the course of 24 hours executed one by one, every couple of, every couple of minutes, most of the judges in the Palace of Justice. In 2002, Doris Salcedo reenacted this massacre in a performance called November 6th and 7th. The performance involved innumerable chairs being slowly descended along the walls of the new Palace of Justice. The descent lasted for the duration of the violent event, 24 hours. Every couple of minutes, another chair was sent down, symbolizing, uh, symbolizing each victim killed that day. How did Salcedo's performance affect the space around the Palace of Justice? Simply speaking, it altered it forever, turning the palace into a haunted house. Again, we return to the uncanny, which often is an essential category to topographies of absence. Salcedo's installation, which is not merely haunted, but rather revisited by a power that was thought long dead. The memory of the massacre is through Salcedo's work awakened. Something that, that should have remained secret had returned, restructuring on a symbolic level the entire urban topography of Bogota. In 2006, Salcedo was invited to make an installation in the historic Castello di Rivoli in Turin. She created Abyss, a claustrophobic brick enclosure which symbolized the post-colonial condition of being shut out physically, intellectually, and metaphorically, likened to the Virginia sense of falling into the abyss, a terrifying vertical drop. Salcedo lowered the brick walls downward as if they were ma mar marquees, effacing the interior, unspacing the entire room, extending the walls so low that the windows opening to the outside only remained visible as a tantalizing but inaccessible world of light and freedom. This made the space literally weighed down into the abyss. This aspect of the work is very important because it functions like Barbrook's symptoms of movement, which, which I talked about at the beginning. It takes hold of the viewer. The promise of space makes the unspace in the room all the more unbearable the effect of absence can only be obtained by negation of presence through its promise or trace, like in Felix Gonzalez Torres' toys. Like in Magritte's famous painting, This is Not a Pipe, which Foucault described as a separation between linguistic signs and visual elements, concluding in a form of semiotic vertigo. The height where the brick walls of Doris Salcedo's abyss, leave off is about 120 centimeters. For most viewers, this is below eye level, so that the outside remains alluring, but strictly invisible, as if it was there and not there. This is not light. This is not space. Since the entire installation resembles a shaft, once inside this prison, one can't stop to think. Will the walls continue to descend, descend and trap us completely? We are left in an unspace, but also suspended in time. According to Widler, it is important to distinguish the general space of the sublime, that of height, depth, and extension, as characterized by Burke, from that of the uncanny, that of silence, solitude, of internal confinement and suffocation. That mental space where temporality and spatiality collapse. In Salcedo's work, the vertigo of the sublime merges with the claustrophobia of the uncanny, 
thus creating a topography of accents par excellence. Thank you.